Sustainability Series. The series is presented through a joint effort of the Environmental Advisory Council of Radnor Township, the Radnor League of Women Voters, and the Radnor Conservancy. My name is Leslie Bowes. I'm the Executive Director of the Conservancy, and I am just delighted to be here to introduce our moderator for the evening. Um, Dottie Ives Dewey has a uh, multiple degrees in civil engineering and regional planning all the way through her doctorate. She's the author of numerous articles on the subject that have appeared in national and international uh, publications. She's currently a, an associate professor at the planning department of, Re of Westchester University. Prior to that, she has over a decade of experience as a land planning consultant uh, with extensive experience in municipal planning. Uh, community and fiscal impact studies, and land development planning. She also served on Radnor's Planning Commission for eight years, three years of that as chair, and we are delighted that she agreed to be a part of this program. So please welcome Dottie Eyes Dewey. Thank you, Leslie. And good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm so glad so many of you were able to come out tonight and happy that there wasn't a snowstorm to get in your way quite yet. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of this program because I think conservation development is a wonderful tool and has a lot of potential um, for Radnor. Those of you who don't know much about conservation development, we're going to hear a lot about it tonight, so I don't want to take up too much time. But it is something that's, that was introduced back in the mid-70s. And um, over the years since then, various municipalities have started to adopt it, and it's proved to be a very effective tool to balance development with, with preservation. Um, but like any good tool, a lot of times in the, the theory is a little different from when you try to implement it and you know, sort of get into the, you know, the devils in the details kind of thing. So what's exciting is that the people that we have here tonight know a lot about the, the details of conservation development and I think are going to bring a lot of insight on how this tool can be used um, and applications that it might have, have in Radnor. So I am going to serve as the moderator and so I'll be introducing our various panelists and I've uh, talked to the panelists and each panelist will go for approximately, give or take, 20 minutes. I'm going to hold off with questions until the end, but we'll have plenty of time at the end of the program for some, some general Q&A and, and the panelists will have, maybe have an opportunity to address each other's questions. So um, our first panelist is Matt Bauman, which many of you know and many in this room know. Matt is the Director of Community Development for Radnor Township. He oversees many of the functions of the township's, uh, township's administration that affect the quality of life for its 31,000 residents. Mr. Bauman is responsible for commercial and residential building inspections, zoning and planning decisions. He works with the township's institutional partners, including Villanova, Eastern, and Cabrini, to address issues regarding expansion. He's also led and designed the master plan for the village of Wayne and worked with the Garrett Hill stakeholders to guide the growth of both areas through smart growth zoning ordinances. So Matt has lots of insight to share in Radnor. Um, Mr. Bowen is a graduate of the University of Missouri and Temple University, and he's also a member of the American Planning Association and the Pennsylvania Association of Code Officials. So please join me in welcoming Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Dottie. Here. Okay, uh, as Dottie mentioned, I'm uh, Matt Bauman. I'm the Director of Community Development and the Zoning Officer for Radnor Township. Um, I'm going to go over some things here that are zoning related. <clears throat> and uh, the first thing I'd like to go over is that uh, in 1928, Radnor Township adopted its uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, in terms of uniting growth and preservation, the 1928 zoning adoption was really meant to now legally dictate where uses and structures would now be placed. <clears throat> the areas of concentration for specific districts were along the Route 30 and Conestoga Road corridors. Also, please note that between 1920 and 1930, um, Radnor's population grew uh, about 50 percent. 
And what you'll see here on the map is the, uh, the commercial corridor here mixed in with uh, tighter residential. But most of the, uh, of the land in the township in 1920 and the 1930s uh, were zoned for uh, farming uh, and large estates. Uh, in slide number four here, um, there were five residential districts at the time, one business district and one, in and one industrial district. There wasn't a whole lot of categories occurring. Um, let's see here. Here's an aerial flown in December of 1937, uh, where the Blue Route currently is. And here's kind of where the Blue Route uh, entrance and exits are. Right here, you can see Conestoga Road. Uh, here's the P&W, uh, whoops. Here's the P&W, let's get back here. The P&W uh, rail line, the R5, uh, Pennsylvania Railroad is right here, uh, and Radnor Chester Road down here. So what you can see is before you're entering into the commercial district down here, is still pretty much large estates uh, and a lot of agricultural uses occurring. Uh, to meet the demands of strong, to, to meet the demands uh, for new housing in the township, the, the, the Radnor Township Board of Commissioners overhauled its zoning in 1951. Um, yet there was almost no consideration at this time uh, given to preserving open space or allocating a certain percentage of land to open space during the land development process. And here, what you can see is that there's a there's starting to be a, there's an opening occurring in terms of uh, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, et cetera, and C1 and C2. So we're starting to really separate uses here. But again, I want to emphasize here that there, uh, there's a large population growth occurring, so there wasn't an emphasis on, um, on preserving open space. So here we can see that dimensional requirements in July of 1955, uh, front, side yard, and rear yard setbacks, again, A1, R1 through R6, C1 through recreational. Uh, some of the height limitations are pretty uh, uh, incredible to me. And for example, in, uh, in C2 and C1 zoning districts, you were allowed to go 85 feet if you met the requirements and parking, of course. So here is uh, population trends that I found in a, a land use plan uh, from 1900 to 1960. Uh, and what you'll see is um, uh, that in 1990, or excuse me, 1900, Radnor Township had 6,110 persons. By 1960, there were 21,697 people in the township. Between 1930 and 1960, Radnor Township grew 77% in population. Here's an aerial flown in June of 1958 of roughly the same area. You can now see the distinct difference in land starting to be carved up into subdivisions perhaps even cul-de-sacs. So land use plan was formed in 1964. Had a lot of language in it specifically targeting population growth. Of course, what followed later on in 1988 was a comprehensive plan, and 15 years later was a 2003 comprehensive plan. But specifically in the 1964 plan, what I found was, was language that targeted uh, uh, concern for uh, the, the consumption of land at a, at a high rate. Uh, every aspect of the land use plan reflects a concern that Radnor's natural and historic heritage be preserved and that the pattern of future growth permit the open character of the township to be retained. And in 1972 it was overhauled again uh, to what we currently have our modern day zoning code. In the 1972 plan and zoning code I found this interesting. This was our first uh, attempt uh, at, at, at securing open space uh, through zoning, and that was through our, our density modification development. And so I wanted to actually grab some further notes here. One second. It's written down here. Okay, specifically, I wanted to, to, to talk about. Um, density modification development. And I think that's, that's, that's really why we're here tonight is, is to talk about open space and, and how we can, what zoning can do through land use controls to, to capture open space. 
And uh, again, it was density modification that was, that was first brought into the zoning code in, in 1972. Um, specifically, uh, density modification was or is targeted to do three things. It's number one, to encourage uh, conservation and use of open space and new residential development. Number two, it's to encourage land development, which preserves trees and natural topography. And number three, it's to encourage attractive arrangements of dwellings by permitting the design and layout of dwellings to be closely related to the physical characteristics of the site in harmony with surrounding tracks. And this process, how it's completed is it's through a conditional use permit through the Board of Commissioners, okay, subject to the conditions as prescribed in the most current comprehensive plan. So you had the plan in 1964, was further modified in 1969, and the Board of Commissioners adopted in 1972 based on the plan in 1969. Okay, so it, the 1970s through the 1990s uh, saw a lot of density modification development. There were 214 acres of preserved uh, land perpetually through density modification development. Some examples of density modification would include Ravenscliff, Round Hill, uh, Inverary, Trianon, Cornerstone, Portlidge, Sturbridge, Brook Farm, DeMoss, Edenton, and so forth. I added it up. It's about 214 acres um, of land that was preserved through open space. Uh, it's preserved as open space. And what that equals, again, doing the math, is that equal uh, about 2.4% of the land. Okay, so we have 8,800 acres in the township. 214 acres were preserved uh, through density modification, uh, which is it's just, that's a, a good total. Uh, and perhaps if it had been incorporated earlier, if the planning had been in place in the 50s and 60s, perhaps that open space could have been even larger. Um, so really, to, to sum up, I mean, how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we correct zoning deficiencies if, if there are zoning deficiencies? I created this uh, relational diagram, and, and really the first step is to, is to address is what, what, what's occurring. At the time in the 60s, population was growing, and so the concern was how do we preserve the land, okay? So next step is to what's your vision? It's to predict what may occur in the future, is to look in that crystal ball and see what the deficiencies are, okay? Next is to create a comprehensive plan, followed by good public input, and then the approval process. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay, um, the, the topic of the talk for our next speaker is Growing Greener, zon Zoning Options for Conservation Development. And we are very fortunate because um, Ann Hutchinson, who's here to speak with us tonight, is really one of the regional, if not national, authorities really on, on um, conservation development. Ann Hutchinson is a certified planner with over 25 years of professional experience. She directs Growing Greener, Conservation by Design, a statewide growth management program administered by Natural Lands Trust in collaboration with the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. As a spokesperson for the program, Ms. Hutchinson conducts workshops, training for practitioners, and technical assistance to, mun to municipalities. To date, she has assisted over 50 Pennsylvania communities in evaluating and updating their land use regulations, designing and reviewing conservation subdivision plans, and assessing conservation priorities. She's also a contributing author of the interactive CD-ROM Growing Greener Ordinance Language, um, before joining the trust in 1996, Ms. Hutchinson was the director of planning and community development for our neighbor, Lower Marion Township, a first-ring suburb of Philadelphia. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you. Thank you. So I work for Natural Lands Trust. We're a regional land conservancy, and we've been preserving land in eastern Pennsylvania and southern New Jersey since 1953. And most of my colleagues have the good fortune to work with landowners who are interested in 
preserving their properties. Um, to date, Natural Lands Trust owns and manages 21,000 acres held in a series of 42 preserves. We also hold conservation easements on another 19,000 acres. This is our Stroud Preserve, um, which is part of um, over a square mile of preserved land that frames the borough of Westchester, Pennsylvania, not too far from here. But we're also a very practical land conservancy. Um, I should have a map of Radnor Township, but this is a township in northern Montgomery County, and the darkest green is land that's already been preserved, or perhaps it can't be developed because it's a floodplain or wetland that's federally regulated. The white areas have been developed, so that medium shade of green is everything that's left that's not protected and not developed. And if you put a post-it note on that plan, this post-it notes 130 acres. So you do the math. If you pay $10,000 an acre to buy land, a lot less than you'd pay around here, your post-it note's worth $1.3 million. If you pay $100,000 an acre to, to buy land, to keep the math easy for an English major, um, the post-it note costs you $13 million. So I think what Natural Lands Trust came to recognize over the years is that you would never meet your conservation goals if you're relying solely on generous landowners and scarce public funds. So we looked a little farther and we started to look at how land is developed. Um, I think that when development applications are filed, residents often like to show up at public meetings and complain about developers. But developers really are law-abiding citizens, and all too often, a developer who's following all the local rules has no choice but to turn a world-class Pennsylvania landscape like this into wall-to-wall -wall houses, streets, and lawns like this. So we need to look not just at the developer before us with the application, but at our own rules, which Matt showed you earlier have evolved in Radnor Township since 1928, some of the earliest zoning codes in the nation, actually. Um, if the only standard we set is that the landscape is converted 100% into houses, streets, and lawns, and we write those rules, then that's what we'll get. Matt talked earlier about the comprehensive plan talking about preserving stream corridors and woodlands. I've read hundreds and hundreds of comprehensive plans, and I've never seen a comprehensive plan that said it's our community's goal to see the landscape converted into cul-de-sacs and lawns. But that's exactly what you're doing when the land use regulations, which are the DNA, set standards like this. So we need to change the rules a little bit. Um, the, rules we encourage townships to adopt for residential development um, are part of a statewide program called Growing Greener Conservation by Design and the Pennsylvania Workbook is um, published nationally by Island Press. Um, communities, this is an excerpt from West Vincent Township and you'll hear from their manager soon, need to think in their plans about what is it they're trying to conserve and certainly in Radnor and most communities in southeastern Pennsylvania, there's been a lot of good planning and attention to those details. And then you need to start to change the rules, both the subdivision ordinance that sets design standards and a process for developing land, and zoning that talks about uses and lot sizes. So within those land use codes, we put in a rule that township officials actually walk around the property with a developer. Has anyone there ever bought a car without taking it for a test drive? Nearly everybody test drives their car, so get outside, kick the tires of the new subdivision in your community, and think about what resources are on that site that could be designed around rather than over. And then in that same subdivision ordinance, we write in what we call the four-step design process. So many times, development discussions begin with road profiles and sewer pipe sizes when they could really begin with a discussion of 
What do we design around? If you can identify the open areas first and connect them so that as your community evolves, you have a network of open space, it's pretty hard to do a really bad development. And then you talk about the houses, the streets, the sewer lines, the trails, and the lot lines become the least significant. This is a variation, I think with a little tune-up, on your own density modification district. And this is by right, because we want this to be the path of least resistance. We want the developer taking the conservation alternative on the left and not the alternative on the right that really disturbs most of the landscape. This is the same number of homes in both scenarios. There's actually 900 feet less road frontage on the left. Some people say, well, we don't care. The developer pays for that. But long term, the community pays for that extra road cost in maintenance of the roads, in managing the stormwater runoff that runs into our streams. So why build roads if you don't need that extra road length? The homes on the left also have views onto the open space, and there are some recent studies that show that those help property values actually appreciate when you have views onto the landscape. There's an older form of development that's taken this approach since the beginning, golf course developments. What golf course development doesn't begin by thinking about the open space first, the golf course? and then the developer tries to put as many homes as possible with views over the landscape. The streets can be fairly short, and the lot lines are pretty insignificant. The National Association of Realtors has done a recent survey that showed that homeowners in America, however, prefer hiking and biking ahead of golf as the top open space amenities they're seeking when they buy a home. So I'm here from a land conservancy actually suggesting that you should build a lot more golf course communities in Radnor Township, but do leave out the golf course <laughs> and substitute whatever else it is you're trying to preserve here. There are a couple of examples in the region. On May 6th, um, we take a school bus out and drive around to some of these developments if you'd like to join us. Um, this is the ponds at Woodward in Kennett Township past the Brandywine River Museum. This is two acre zoning, similar to your um, ag preservation district. One home for every two acres of ground, but about two thirds of the site is left open, including an orchard that would have normally been filled with a cul-de-sac and homes. One of the nicest features here is that by putting the lots on a diet, when you drive by the entrance road to this development, the countryside looks very much like the surrounding Kennett Township rural roads. You're not looking at um, a large detention basin or the back of a new home, but you're seeing an entry into the development. All of the homes, whether they're townhouses or singles, have views over the orchard or views over the pond. And keep in mind that in most communities, including Radnor Township, this development would be illegal. You do have a density modification district that allows smaller lots, but these lots are townhouses and single family homes on a third of an acre. You are, your codes would not allow a developer to put homes on that small amount of space. In Southern Chester County in London Grove Township, the square in the middle of that plan is the borough of West Grove. Um, they've been fortunate to see some of the horse farms um, on the upper right hand corner of that, preserved with conservation easements. South of Route 1, they extended public sewer um, and water, and developers came up from Wilmington faster than they knew what was going on. So, for every one good acre of ground, they quickly changed their ordinances to say you can build one house for every acre of buildable ground. But those homes have to be on less than half an acre and half of the property has to be preserved as open space. So these are two conservation subdivisions that are linked. And that hatched area on the right is about 45 acres of a 140 acre site that a developer donated to the township 
at no cost. He made his money selling the homes. The township achieved their first park. When I started working here in 2002, they had no public parkland through this subdivision process. All of their subdivisions are connected with public trails so the kids can start to walk between these neighborhoods. The homes look pretty much like the other market rate homes you see throughout southern Chester County. And they have also have management plans. In this case, on the left-hand side, the farmer who um, was originally raising hay there had cleared right to the edge of the stream. This is a tributary to the middle branch of the White Clay Creek, a national wild and scenic corridor. And they are now planting trees. Those white tubes are, are deer protection tubes to restore the riparian buffer. So these ordinances, which shrink the lots and require the open space, are sort of a riparian buffer on steroids. They're giving this community the ability to shade those streams again where the woods have been removed. More important, London Grove has paired their zoning code with a local open space referendum. So the sort of yellow green on the left are the homeowners association lands with trails. On the upper right is that 40 acres the developer donated. There's a little rectangle that's seven acres that the township purchased. A larger property that was donated. A green easement that was purchased. Another easement purchased. So this township has pretty much achieved a greenway from the borough of West Grove down into the White Clay Creek Preserve. And in the matter of a decade, has created a park and greenway system for residents at very low public cost. Next door in Villanova, um, Pollock Builders um, is the developer of Harriton, a 44-acre estate in Lower Marion Township. Um, when I started working for Lower Marion Township in 1987, the last of the largest states were being subdivided. So as a fairly developed first ring community, we weren't able to achieve community-wide greenway networks, but we certainly used, and the township continues to use, the codes to preserve settings for historic buildings, places to infiltrate stormwater, places for community trail systems. Harriton won an award from the Montgomery County Planning Commission for its ability to both preserve the setting for a historic house. There were um, seven houses here, I believe five of them were preserved. The main house on the middle left is by the architect William Price. Um, and also preserving some of the natural features on the site. This 44 acres, it's at the corner of um, Spring Mill Road and Old Gulf Road, if you know it, sort of had the last meadow left in the township, a pond that framed the historic buildings, and some woodlands. And the plan sort of fits hand in glove so that the field was preserved on the corner, the stream valley that connects to a neighboring conservation subdivision has been preserved, and some of the woodlands were able to be retained. It's the field on the upper left. And in the woods, they constructed um, some earthen berms that infiltrate the stormwater. So rather than a large basin or crater, stormwater is managed there in infiltration berms. And um, this is a developer that had no problem selling homes for over a million dollars on lots that are only about a third of an acre, but surrounded by 25 acres of permanently protected open space. These developments I've shown you have no increase in the number of homes over what would have normally been built. Every now and then there are reasons for communities to allow more homes in certain areas of the community. Why is that? Well, we're seeing the two largest generations in American history age and we're seeing the baby boomers start to move out of their large homes and we're seeing the millennials think about buying their first homes. Nearly 60 percent of households in America are now one and two person households. We know that single men make nine percent of home purchases. 
for reasons I personally don't understand, we know that single women are making 21% of home purchases. So 30% of our households are quite small. And where do these singles want to live? In the Pacific Northwest, they're building a lot of bungalow courts, very small single family homes around open courtyards at pretty high densities, about eight homes for every acre of ground. There's some tradition of these small singles on the Pennsylvania landscape. Um, perhaps ahead of his time in the late 1980s, Len Blair and Son from Bryn Mawr built Deerfield Knoll in Willistown Township. These homes are only 55 feet apart. Most of our new homes now are on lots that are 100 to 150 feet wide. These are in about a third of the frontage. Small singles, they're built in a townhouse district, beautifully landscaped, careful attention to privacy walls between the units. Chip Vaughn's gonna talk about his experience in Rose Valley Borough building small single homes on the Saul Estate, the last 26 acre estate in Rose Valley. And I will say that the most significant thing in my view about Traymore is that at the end of the process in that photograph, you see Mayor Tim Plummer in the early 196 mayor's hat, shaking Chip's hand, and they're smiling. There was no litigation over this development. West Vincent Township, where um, our speaker Jim Wendelgass has served as manager for many years, looked at a large 300-acre tract at Route 401 and 100, the two highest volume roads in northern Chester County, and that's where they allowed a few more homes than usual in an effort to preserve some of the beautiful landscape beyond. You can see the darkest green core that they hope to preserve. This is by the Hankin Group of Exton. Um, and on this 300 acres, the 273 homes fit hand in glove with the goal of creating an edge between this busier road intersection and the beautiful rural landscape beyond. This is done in um, a traditional neighborhood design with homes very close together, looking like some of the more urban neighborhoods in, in Radnor, designed around internal open spaces and with a branch of the Chester County Library. So although not for, for all locations in a community, there may be places where a few extra homes are desired. There are also times when many, many fewer homes are the goal. And that's when a great community effort is required. This is an example from the Peconic Land Trust in Long Island that they put together to show um, actually some potential donors what could be done with attractive land. So here's the tract of land and certainly what they didn't want to see was that all of it would be subdivided except the wetlands that can't be developed. A better solution, although not ideal, was the same number of homes on a conservation development pattern, which would require no public expenditure of money. And with a combination of some private donation and public money, you could do sort of a limited development plan, a very small number of homes, and in this case, they're starting to see some vineyards. Another great example of repurposing a historic property is um, Stone Barns, the Center for Food and Agriculture. Um, it's just north of the Tappan Zee Bridge in the Hudson River Valley. In 1998, David Rockefeller started looking at long the long-term feasibility of maintaining um, a family's his the family's historic barn on about 80 acres. The goal there, which took many, many years of public meetings and creative partnerships with nonprofits was to repurpose the historic barns, which now serve as a 150 seat restaurant, three acres of organic gardens that provide food for the restaurant, 22,000 square feet of greenhouses, and an education center, and a fund to help um, maintain the property in perpetuity. 
Another reason to put open space in your new developments is sort of the next generation. There's a lot of talk about childhood obesity, lack of connection to the outdoors, and conservation subdivisions put open space right in the backyard of the next generation. No driving required. So I remind you that if your ordinances aren't producing the types of communities you'd like to see, stop horsing around and make a few changes. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And I just have to comment, those are beautiful graphics. I really enjoy this. Um, the subject of our the title of the next talk is A Success Story, Traymore, a Conservation Development in Delaware County. And our speaker is one of those law-abiding developers <laughs> that Anne had mentioned in her talk. Um, Nelson, or Chip Vaughn, from Vaughn and Sauter Builders. Chip Vaughn is president of Vaughn and Sauter Builders, a suburban Philadelphia company which builds custom and semi-custom homes from 600000 to over $5 million, if you're in the market. Um, Chip's mechanical and aerospace engineering degree from the University of Delaware and 36 years of hands-on experience in the building profession are reflected in each of his homes. His communities have, seen, have uh, excuse me, received numerous accolades, and Chip himself has been recognized by his peers, both locally and nationally, with awards such as Builder of the Year. He, is named, he was named one of America's best builders by the National Association of Home Builders and Builder Magazine. Chip is described as one of a handful of builders for, hum, for whom excellence is a constant companion. This award recognizes overall professional achievement and excellence in product and community design, customer service, community, and industry service. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Wan. Yeah, it was, it was interesting uh, when Matt was talking about all the um, communities that were done under the uh, density modification. I probably did half of them. So, um, and I would have to say, it, 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 Brook Farm being um, probably one of the more interesting ones, but uh, it, it, it was and still is probably one of the best um, creators of open space. The only thing I would say, and I'll get into this in a little bit, is that um, the, the problem is, is that people today are sort of backing away from what everybody's called the McMansion. And so <clears throat> we need to be thinking about not just open space, but probably a little bit different um, housing design um, to really accommodate the, uh, what, what really is of happening in, in the economy as well as in people's minds these days. Um, Anyway, um, I'm not a techno person, so I've just brought a bunch of boards here that uh, hopefully we can get up on the screen. And um, um, maybe I have to do something that I don't know. Anyway, um, Rose Valley, um, as Ann said, uh, well, first of all, Rose Valley is a little borough. If you don't know much about it, it's uh, just south of Media. Um, this is my pointer. If you can see on the plan, this is, this is it. Media is right up here, up this way. And Rose Valley Borough is this piece of ground that, um, before I got involved, contained about 380 houses. Um, it was um, developed by um, uh, Will Price, who um, actually, um, if you remember, Ann showed a house in the Harriton development. Um, he was a builder developer at the turn of the last century, and he created this little place called Rose Valley, <clears throat> which um, you have to go there to believe it. My sister says you, you can only go there when the moon's out, but um, um, anyway, uh, at, the, at the time, somebody came to me and said, by the way, there's this piece of ground that's on the market in Rose Valley. I said, well, you know, what's Rose Valley? <laughs> um, and it, it consisted of 26 acres. Now, it's going to be a little hard to see, but this is it right here. Um, 
And at the time, it was um, basically zoned one acre. And um, I saw it. It was beautiful. It still is. And the people um, that sort of love Rose Valley, the people who kind of keep things going in the right direction, said to me, geez, we are scared to death if you put um, one acre lots there. This is, in essence, what it would have looked like. Um, there are 22 lots which you could have gotten on this property. Um, this is uh, Rose Valley Road. If anybody's familiar, the Hedgerow Theater is <coughs> directly across the street over here. Um, but all of what this would have meant was that all of the historic houses that are around here, and there are many of them, in fact, Rose Valley just got half of the, the area around here, or more than half of it, designated as a National Historic um, uh, Place. And so all of the backs of these houses, all of the backyards would have, would have really um, backed up to all of this um, historic area. So I sat down and had a conversation with <coughs> uh, the mayor. Actually, he wasn't the mayor then. He was the head of borough council. And uh, I said, geez, could we think about doing something else? Like, how about smaller houses on part of the ground and um, can we raise the density enough that I can afford to pay for what's here, I mean, afford to pay what they want based on the one acre zoning, but have something that not only, only fills half the, the, um, the ground, but really um, is keyed more to what people um, want. We did a lot of uh, um, focus groups and stuff to actually find out exactly what people did want. Um, the, uh, the, so anyway, um, if you want to get me there, I was going to show, I'm just going to show you some, give me that, that one right there. One. These are some of the, um, historic houses that were actually on the property. Um, this is, um, this one here is a house that Will Price actually renovated in about 1902. It was a, earlier, it was just a, an old um, farmhouse. Um, we, we, and I'll show you on the final plan, we kept this house. I was extremely lucky and was able to sell it to um, a gentleman who, excuse me, consequently put a lot of money into it and created what is basically a museum. Um, this structure here is out at the end of this um, trellis. And believe it or not, it was an old water tower that was converted just to a, a tower. This property here is a uh, structure that Will Price built for his own studio. Um, and this structure, um, I can tell you a little more about, but it, it was kind of off to the side of the property, and everybody called it the gatehouse. Um, so what we did um, was to say to the borough, how about if we just talk about a different approach? And I have to tell you, the reason this all worked was because <laughs> they never had any subdivision done in the township before, or the borough. They had no preconceived ideas. Um, they were really open to just about anything that I could think of. Luckily, um, they hired uh, the Natural Lands Trust to come in and be their eyes and ears and to write the ordinance that we needed to write in order to make this work. And um, we, between the Natural Lands Trust, myself, and the borough, we spent about a year or so um, doing just what Ann talked about. Um, we got uh, Andrew Bunting, who is a well-known arborist, um, to come and walk the property and show us and tag the trees that we thought were worth keeping, and better yet, that the borough thought were worth keeping, the houses we wanted to save. Um, uh, and then, um, the, if you saw that uh, thing that Rambo learned, uh, 
wrote. Um, he actually came to the property, and he <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. He just walked around and said, okay, we're going to save this, we're going to save this. And he stood there with a piece of paper, and he basically said, okay, and we're going to put the houses kind of here and here, and we're going to put a road. I said, you can't put a road like that. There's, it's, the curves are too sharp. The road's too narrow. They'll never, they'll never ever go for it. And um, everybody's looking at me like, what are you talking about? We'll go for anything. <laughs> but, the, but the bottom line was is that, is, that the, is that what that did was it saved certain trees, it saved certain view sheds, it saved some houses um, and, and other things, and it worked. Um, the road is basically 18 feet wide, which sounds, um, and here's, yeah, and, it, and it, we, we had to really also engage the rest of the borough. Now, that was fairly easy because you only have 380 houses. Radnor, I don't know how many there are. I've created a number of them myself, so there's a lot more than 380. But we opened the property up one day and said, everybody who wants to come, because the people who lived there before were kind of, uh, I don't want to put it, they were not very friendly and they made everybody stay away. So we opened the property up and said, come look at this. And here's what we want to do. Um, the first few questions were the normal ones, like, well, if you do something like this, it's going to ruin everybody's property value. Um, or if you're going to do something like this, it's going to create a huge traffic problem. Um, but uh, we kind of persevered, and in a number of public open meetings, we talked about all those things. and. As best I could, I tried to reassure people that, in fact, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and just real quickly, um, I'll try to show you. If you this, is the, this is Rose Valley Road here. Um, there's this bridge. This bridge, um, again, this couldn't happen in many places, but this bridge is probably 110 years old. Um, I had to have it surveyed, um, and a lot of people had to look at it before they would believe me that it was probably stronger than any bridge that is built today. We drive concrete trucks in and out of there all the time. Um, but it's a beautiful bridge. Um, and then what we did was we looked at the trees. You can't really see from your plan, but the, there's trees, very large. This is a Dawn uh, Redwood, which is probably about 80 feet tall, one of the biggest ones that I've ever seen. Um, this is a uh, willow oak that pretty much takes up this entire green area here. A um, couple other things. The area surrounding this property over here is a wildlife preserve. Um, down here is a place called the Old Mill. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, it's uh, just what it is. An old, it was an old mill. Um, it's used for community gatherings for um, people in the, in the borough along with a bunch of neighbors. I go to some of those functions. And they're always interesting. Um, but more importantly, you can see that this, this it's a little hard because the other uh, piece of paper I had was the scale was a little um, smaller. But this is basically the same exact piece of ground. Um, and now all of the darker green area, which is, doesn't really show up very well, but this area here, and this area here was all set aside for um, dedication to the um, borough. It increased the size of their wildlife preserve by 50%, I mean, it made the thing 100% bigger or doubled it. This piece over here basically kept the view shed from Rose Valley Road to exactly what it was before. We added a trail. There's a trail that basically, well, the whole borough's full of trails. Um, and um, they go everywhere. But we added this trail down through here, and then there's a trail that runs around back over in here. I'm off the page, but anyway, and we added a piece to connect the, the whole thing. Um, but believe it or not, and um, Ann sort of um, alluded to this, where we only had 21 or two large houses, this has 43. Um, taking up about half the amount of space. This, this part right here is the house with the tower, completely preserved and um, actually renovated. It's, it's a masterpiece. Um, 
And that lot consists of this space with half of it being preserved as private open space. Um, the lighter green area, which again is a little hard to see, is open space that's part of the uh, Homeowners Association. And the yellow boxes that you see are the individual lots that the, these are actually carriage homes, two units and three units in a building. Huh? Yeah, the other thing that uh, um, we decided what we wanted to do was to create what we, what in the business is called age targeted as opposed to age restricted. I was scared to death of age restricted because I just, it goes against my nature, but um, Believe it or not, we, we basically targeted it by, by first of all, making all the, ho the homes two bedrooms and didn't create any kind of swing sets and those kinds of things for children. So um, we've sold 30 of the 43 houses up till now and believe it or not, we don't have any children. <laughs> um, the, uh, but it worked, and, and um, like I say, the, and the key to this community was as much the fact that the borough, one, didn't have any preconceived ideas, and you can, actually going back to my comment about the curves, you can see, I mean, these curves are nowhere in the world could you get a normal engineer to agree that that was a safe curve. The fact of the matter is that you can't go very fast around it, so it's probably safer than a one that they like. But, um, uh, the, um, I'm old, so I forget what I was, what I was going to say, but anyway, the, um, uh, I think, I think everybody was, oh, I know about the density. Um, the fact that there's 43 units here when there could, might have only been 21 big houses, um, has not disrupted, and I, I could get every single person in the borough to come tell you this, um, has not disrupted the flow of the borough. In fact, I think they're all pleased as, as punch with it. The picture that you saw that Ann um, uh, showed you with me and, and the mayor with his hat on was the day they took dedication of the um, open space. And they even gave me a silver dollar for the, um, the dollar that they paid me for the open space. But it was, it was kind of cool. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I might uh, get emotional about this. It might, I always say I'm glad my sister was at this meeting, but the, the last meeting we had when they finally approved this plan, which by the way took two years, including right in a whole completely new ordinance, going through numerous planning commission and land development meetings with, and borough meetings, um, still only took two years. And at the last meeting, they brought out, um, after they voted in favor, they brought out a tray with champagne and champagne flutes. <laughs> Being involved. <laughs> right. So anyway, um, I'll be here for questions. But uh, if I would, if you're involved in this process or or, or are interested in it, come look at Traymore because it is even with all the snow and the piles of snow that are all dirty and everything, it's still a beautiful place. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. I have to say I can't remember the last time we toasted a new approved development with Champagne and Radnor. I just don't remember when that was. That says a lot. Um, okay, our fourth speaker is, um, title of our fourth speaker's talk is, What's in it for Radnor? The municipal point of view. So kind of shifting focus here. And our speaker is Jim Wendelgas, and Jim is the West Vincent Township Manager. Jim Wendelgas is currently the Township Manager for West Vincent Township. He had previously served, served the Township in the capacity of Chairman and member of the Township's Planning Commission and the Environmental Advisory Council. He also had previously served as the Executive Director of the West Vincent Land Trust. He is a graduate of Syracuse and Case Western Reserve Universities and practiced for many years as an environmental attorney before taking the position with the Township. So please join me in welcoming Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, 
I'm not sure I'm going to use the microphone. I have some nasty habits. And one of those is I tend to walk around a lot. Um, and I'll say from the start, the, the Board of Supervisors of Westminster Township know I'm here. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Just because we, we are televising this and trying right. to, to you would use the microphone. I'll, I'll try to use the microphone. Um, the supervisors of West Vincent Township know that I'm here, uh, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the township. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Uh, I've been the township manager since uh, 2004, uh, and I've seen a lot of things happen in the township. Uh, I, the first speaker was great tonight because uh, uh, West Vincent Township really is uh, what Radnor was in 1900. Uh, as of the last census, uh, West Vincent Township had 3,170 residents. Uh, it's about um, 18 square miles, which is uh, roughly 11,500 acres, so it's larger than Radnor. Uh, if you don't know where we are, just go to the downtown exit of the Turnpike, take Route 100 north, go through the nice village of Eagle, and just after you get through Eagle or go there's a new bypass, so that now you can go actually around Eagle without going through Eagle. So if you do that uh, and go past the Lexus dealer, there's a hill, and it's called Black Horse Hill. That's the start of West Vincent Township, and we go basically up to French Creek from there. Um, in 1998, uh, I was on the Planning Commission. I was actually chairman of the Planning Commission, uh, and the township uh, adopted a growing greener uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, this is um, the 2010 consolidated zoning ordinance for the township. Uh, our first zoning ordinance was in 1955. Uh, so we were well behind almost anyone else. Uh, and just to give you a little flavor for the township, uh, we still have 16 miles of dirt roads. We call them gravel roads, but the reality is they're dirt roads. Um, so we uh, we are very different, but we clearly were in the crosshairs of development. Uh, and since the adoption of a growing greener ordinance uh, in 1998, we've had approximately 1,300 acres go into development. Um, so the first question is, what does a growing green, greener ordinance do for you? Well, uh, through use of that ordinance, uh, the township has, I don't know how you, how, uh, retained, kept, developed, whatever you want to call it, over 63% of the land remains as either open space or greenway. I may use either term. It's because we used to call it open space. We now call it greenway. I've had to make sure in the consolidated ordinance that every reference to open space is now a reference to greenway. Uh, and there are some reasons for that, among others, because the, the planners like to call it greenway rather than open space. Um, and for us, and for me, it really doesn't make much difference other than it is something that we get as a matter of course from a development in our township. Uh, just to give you a flavor, prior to 1998, we had basically three residential districts, R2, R3, and RC, which stood for Rural Conservation. It was basically two acre, three acre, and five acre zoning. After 1998, you had the option, the developer had the option to develop the property in one of four or five ways. We call them tiers. You could have 10 acre estates, you could have five acre estates. You could have a uh, density that roughly is uh, two acres one unit for every two acres. And then we had uh, another tier, which was uh, essentially uh, one unit for every acre and a half. After the ordinance was adopted, uh, a new tier five was put in. Uh, tier five says you can have two to an acre, um, and it's for apartments. And you might think that we're absolutely crazy and greedy because for tiers three, four, and five, there's mandatory greenway or open space requirements. For tier three, it's 50%. Tier four, it's 60%. And tier five, the apartment tier, it's 85%. You might ask, has anybody done any development 
in West Vincent Township since this was adopted? And the answer is absolutely. We've had approximately 14 fairly large developments. I'm not counting the ones and twosies. Um, covering 1,300 acres. Um, we have had a large apartment complex built on approximately 125 acres. There's 216 units. There's 82.5% open space. And virtually all of that open space is, in fact, owned by the township. So does it work? The answer is, from the West Vincent standpoint, and I certainly can't speak for you because we're obviously very different than you, is that it works. It works very well. And it works very well with developers that you might have heard of. The apartments are actually now owned and operated by a company called Oxford, which is out of Atlanta, Georgia. They own and operate between 34 and 35,000 apartment units. The largest single development in the township was Toll Brothers in Orleans. The Hankin development, which Ann showed pictures of, was the Hankin Group, a large local developer. Cutler Group also did a large development within the township. I don't know if it's going to be built or not. Uh, you know, things change. Uh, and that's one that has final approval, but it hasn't been built yet. And we have smaller developers like uh, Woodstone, a local developer, and Southdown, uh, another local developer, that have also done developments. So in doing this, we've averaged slightly over 60% open space through the development process. And what's the number one reason why we do this? The answer is money. It doesn't cost us a dime. It doesn't cost the municipality anything other than the cost to adopt the zoning. This is what the municipality gets through the development process. And if you want to develop in West Vincent, and we've not had people challenge the ordinance, this is what you're going to do. You're going to have open space associated with your development. Does it work? And why does it work? I think one of the things that makes it work is someone in their infinite wisdom, and it wasn't me, and I don't know who it was, decided that there would be no minimum lot size. So the developer comes in, looks at the parcel, looks at the market, and then determines what they can build and what they can build that will sell. And what has it been? Well, several years ago, it was large houses on relatively small lots. What we're seeing now is smaller houses. Not small houses, but smaller houses, still on relatively small lots. Does it work? It seems to work for us. What the average house price in West Vincent in, for a new sale in 2010 was just around $600,000. So we are not talking about, um, you know, unfortunately, low-income housing. These are expensive units on lovely properties in what I consider a very lovely township. I will also say that I happen to be a resident of West Vincent Township. Uh, my wife and I have lived there for 25 years. So um, what it's meant is that you know, there is obviously for the township a need for more infrastructure. Um, you'll be happy to know that we are getting our second traffic light um, <laughs> sometime in February. Uh, that's going to be near the brand new elementary school, which was built at the cost of, I think, $23 million, uh, right across uh, Route 401 from the uh, Hankin Library. Um, it's the, uh, uh, one of the satellites. One of, it's a gorgeous satellite for, from the Chester County Library System. So um, the answer is, uh, why we do it? Well, West Vincent, at least in the last few years, uh, has a history of uh, conservation, a history of, uh, it's not anti-development, because uh, quite frankly, these ordinances allow the development. In some cases, they'll allow densities greater than what were allowed before. Uh, so development is allowed. And that's the key thing about these ordinances. Development's allowed, but if you're going to do development of a certain density, then there's a trade-off. 
And that's the open space trade-off. So that's what I refer to, me personally, as the number one line of defense to the township. You've got your zoning. Your zoning requires open space. Now, the township has also had two open space referendum. It also has, in this ordinance, a TDR, transferable development rights uh, section, which has been used by developers to get even more density on certain parcels by buying development rights from areas of the township and moving them to the, air, to the relatively few areas of the township that have infrastructure that can stand a more dense development. So the township really, um, the backbone to its preservation of open space in the township is its zoning ordinance and is this approach. It does things beyond that, but, but this ordinance is, is really the backbone of that approach. Um, it's also meant for the township. Uh, township has gotten just shy of 300 acres of open space, which have been deeded to it as part of this process. Uh, next question, I'm sure, is what do you do with it? And the answer is uh, we've worked with Natural Lands Trust to develop a greenway management guide, which applies to both the township as the owner, to developers, and to the homeowners associations who, quite frankly, are the, are the ones who basically, for the most part, end up managing a large part of the open space in the township. So they know from the start that there's going to be management requirements that they have to meet. And quite frankly, we really don't have problems with them meeting them. One of the other things that's been very helpful for the township, at least, is that with respect to a lot of the open space that it has directly acquired, a lot of that has been farmland. And what we do is we lease it to farmers from West Vincent. That's part of our uh, RFP, a request for proposal, that we put out. Uh, and we require that the farmer be from West Vincent. Uh, and if not, there's other provisions that will allow other people to bid on it. Uh, but we take the highest bidder. And we lease that out. And uh, one of the requirements is that around the fields, they must maintain perimeter trails. So we have the farmer doing some of our work for us because there's a very extensive trail network within the township. And this helps maintain part of it and, ex and in some cases, expand part of it. So um, that's really what's in it for the township. Uh, the next question is, what's in it for the developer? Well, what's in it for the developer is, as Ann said, your infrastructure costs are lower because the infrastructure is con uh, concentrated. One of the things that we don't have in West Vincent Township is we, for the most part, don't have public water and public sewer. So a developer's got to build a sewer plant or do on-site and do either wells or an on-site water system. Again, those are significant costs. Then there's the road system. But by concentrating the development, you know, there's substantial savings in terms of certain parts of the infrastructure. You don't have to run your lines as long. You don't have the roads that aren't going to be as long. So, and then there's the maintenance requirements for those. So the township likes it because we're going to take over that roads, those roads and sewer lines and water plants. They're going to be dedicated to us. And we want them to be as small as possible. So there are some benefits which also accrue to us from from thinking about these things in advance and having things done in advance and, re and, and requiring plan uh, the planning in advance. Um, I already talked about the flexibility. By having no minimum lot size, you know, developers can basically do whatever the market is going to let them do. So that's very important to us. Uh, in terms of challenges, obviously maintenance is a challenge. We think we've addressed it, but that's going to be a continual problem. Uh, the other issue is when this was first adopted, we attempted to apply it to all lots of whatever size. And the answer is it doesn't work really well for lots under 10 acres. Uh, the open space you get isn't really terribly useful open space, and it just doesn't work terribly well. So one of the things we did when we did our consolidation is we took that out and said basically, okay, if you're going to develop a lot, it's under 10 acres, we're going to go back to the old requirements, and it's two acre, three acre, and five acre lots. Uh, we'll see how that works. But uh, I hope I've 
address some of your questions and concerns. For us, it has been a very useful tool. It is a tool that um, the national developers are very comfortable with. It doesn't seem to be a particular problem with them. They've worked with us, uh, and the design of the developments have been what we want it to see. It's a little harder with smaller developments, but it's, it's something that with work you can do. So that's all I have, and I think we're back now okay. to questions. Good. Thank, Thank you, you, Tim. Thank you. Again, thanks to, to all four. I think that each of your talks has provided a lot of insight on this topic and gave us a real comprehensive and holistic um, view of, of the subject. And um, so now we have, we have plenty of time for, for question and answer. And, and if you all don't mind, I think I'll indulge myself the, the first question here and then um, I'll open it up for anybody who has questions in the audience. But my question is, since we're you know, kind of looking at this and considering this for Radner, if any of you, all of you have thoughts on any particular challenges that a community like Matt had started out saying, we're a mature township. I mean, we've had zoning ordinances that, that go, the most recent update right back in the 1970s. Um, and from, from your experience with this, if there are unique challenges to communities like Radnor um, in trying to implement this, this type of ordinance. So I'll just toss that out if anybody wants to respond. I'll try this thing. Hmm. <laughs> I'm usually sitting out there as opposed to up here. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not, ex I mean, um, is there a challenge? Uh, it, it, one of the things, it, certainly the difference is that you have public water and public sewer. It makes smaller lots and higher density much easier to do. Um, you know, I look at, uh, I've, you know, I've been building in this township for a long time, and, you know, I look at pieces of, of ground, the biggest one is obviously our Drossen property, and you look at, at, um, what, what's been done on parts of it where you have these large houses on big lots. And I just wished that I had the opportunity to um, build a Traymore in the middle of that property because um, where, you know, you might have eight houses on the, the property that's bordered by Newtown Road and, you know, Chanticleer and Brook Road and so forth. Um, you could put a, you could put, a, don't take this wrong, but you could put 50 units in there that you would never see. And it would fill the need for what people come into our community at Traymore, for instance, um, and say, geez, why can't you build this on the main line? And I'll say, well, because it just isn't any place to do it. But peop, that's what, I keep saying, it, it, the challenge today is, is that, that the, the, the Obviously, the demographics are changing, and there, there's, got, there's a huge need for people my age and probably most everybody in here who want to downsize or um, uh, have less maintenance and less carrying costs, less utility costs, less everything. Um, but unless you can build something smaller and more of them and yet create an environment where they um, don't seem to impact, I mean, that's the challenge, in my opinion. I, I, I'm not sure I answered your question totally, but um, at least from a developer's, uh, Ann said it perfectly, a developer's going to, and, and I think you said, Jim said it too, is that developer's going to build what people want, given the opportunity to do that. Um, I mean, they're not stupid. They don't, you know, they don't just build for the sake of building. They build because they hope people will, or they, they do the research and hope people will buy the product that they're, they're doing. And so, if you give them the opportunity, given certain restraint or restrictions, they'll do what the majority of people want. It's just, it's a little scary. I, I, just going back to my presentation, because I keep thinking of all the things I should have said, um, one of the biggest things we kept getting asked was, this is going to really impact the, 
the real estate values around here. And I kept trying to say, I really don't think it will. And you just, you know, you got to have faith that it won't. Well, I would argue that it's probably increased the value of most real estate in the borough just because it just creates a, a, a really nice environment for all the people that live there. And they've all become friends of all the other people that live in the borough and so forth and so on. So. I think there are sort of three issues I'd start looking at in an inner ring suburb like um, in Radnor. One is um, historic buildings. Many of the estates that are subdivided really need an appropriate setting. Um, when I worked for Lower Marion, we allowed that ground under the historic building to count as open space. And the result was um, we started to see many more of the historic mansions preserved. And although it's still a problem, although demolition of historic buildings is still a problem, it was um, less prevalent when you could count that ground under a historic mansion as open space, as you see in Harriton, where they preserve those buildings. The second is the threshold. I agree with Jim that in a rural community like West Vincent, 10 acres, which in his community is about five or six homes, is, is probably the right number. As you get closer to the big city and ground's a little more precious, you might look at a threshold of around five or six acres rather than something as large as 10. Um, and finally, you have to grapple with the D word, which is density. Um, there may be some areas in your township where lot size doesn't matter. It could be OK to use a formula to determine the number of houses. But I've also found in a lot of fairly developed communities, the only way um, that it's acceptable to determine the number of homes is sort of by a yield plan, where you see what could a developer get today under your conventional zoning. And we're willing to live with that number of homes. It can be on small lots, larger lots, um, but we don't want to see any extra homes. Sometimes that's very important to community. And sometimes when going through this process, a community will say, along this major road at this major intersection in this transition zone between the countryside and our downtown, mm, maybe we do want a few more homes here. So you have to think through what density where and how do you determine that magical number? So those are sort of the three things I would look at here. Thank you. OK, well, now we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. And um, Leslie has got the mobile microphone. So just ask, because this is being taped, um, if you have a question, to, to please use the microphone so that it can be heard. And if you could also just, just maybe introduce yourself before you ask your question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia Hurl. Um, since you were just talking about density, I had a question about the Traymore development, which is lovely. Um, it seemed like the number of units was almost doubled there, ultimately, from the plan that would have eaten up all the property into the final plan that you have now. Do you think that would have worked with less density? Using the smaller units on even less land, was it necessary to put in as many extra units as would previously have been allowed, or would it have worked in a different scenario? Um, th this, is, this is always the, the difficult part. It all comes down to money. Somebody said that earlier. I don't know who it was. But th 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 because um, in that particular case, the property was owned by heirs of Morris Saul, who was the pe person who owned it way back um, from the Saul Ewing law firm. They wanted a certain amount of money for that property based on the base zoning. And they weren't going to budge off of that number. So if you're going, if, if you think about it, if you're going to try to produce the, the housing that we did, um, these are 2,500 square foot carriage homes that would sell for less than half of what the, the um, single family house would have had to have sold for relative to the land price. Everything kind of starts with the land price. Then, then you put in the cost of the development infrastructure, and then you can figure out what you can sell houses for. Um, 
the problem today is, is that we all did that back when everything was booming and now you know that, that's a whole other story but in essence if you think about it if if you're going to if if you're going to have to pay the same amount of money you're almost going to have to double the density to be able to sell something for half as much i mean that's kind of where it comes from and so you know most people um, think that somehow having twice as many houses there w was just going to be, um, a, a, or m I wouldn't say most people there because, again, they just had a completely open mind. It was the most amazing um, thing. But it's, it, it has not created, if you, if, you were to, if you were to stand out at the entrance and there is only one, um, now there's 30 houses there uh, that are occupied today. The traffic going in and out of there is like one car maybe every 20 minutes, I don't, I mean, first of all, they're age targeted, so they're not all working people, but it's just, the traffic wasn't an issue, um, and the fact that we were able to, to basically give almost 15 acres one way or another to open space um, and yet, yet double the density, that the answer is, yes, you can not have as many, but then you're going to have to charge more, at which point then they won't sell, and so you kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. It really, as much as anything, is as much financial as, as anything else, um, and that's why I, you know, I do think it, in some cases you have to look at um, um, density as part of the equation, especially in an infill situation um, around here. It, you, if you're out in West Vincent where you're going to have the same number of houses on just smaller lots and you can get the seller to sell you those, sell you the ground based on what those smaller houses on smaller lots would sell for, then you're fine. You don't need to increase the density. Um, but because we didn't have an ordinance that said we could do something different, we had to go on what was the, in, in Tremor anyway, we had to go on what was there so I think under density modification there is a bonus there's a density bonus of some sort no yeah it's a it's a it's a one to three ratio or three you know for every three percent open space it's one one density increase and I, I just kind of remember it's been a long time Brook Farm was the last density modification thing I did but um, I do remember there was um, some bonus for adding open space and if you look at the open space that that Brook Farm created, I think it's part of your trail system now that the... Uh, yeah, and the, that, the other bonus is that you don't have to com conform to the, the underlying zoning. If it's R1, it doesn't have to be a minimum one acre lot as long as you retain that open space. Minimum 15 percent, um, let's say 10 acres. So, you know, you get there, there's a trade-off there. Right. I don't know if I answered your question, but... Is Jen here? Other questions? Hi, um, I'm Donna Galvin, and this is um, for, I think it's Jim, West Vincent. Um, you kind of touched on this, but for all the Greenway, is there a provision for public access for trails or some kind of access, or is it only in certain configurations? Well, for the land that goes to the township, public access is a given. Uh, for uh, land that's going to be maintained by the Homeowners Association, uh, usually what the township does as part of the subdivision process is negotiates uh, trails and other access to it. There are certain areas that the homeowners associations generally want to keep for the residents, uh, and that's fine as long as there is going to be uh, access to trails. And one of the things we work with very clo closely with the developer in the, in the subdivision process is to make sure that the trails go somewhere and that they link to other trails. So, uh, I mean, it's something as large as, as the Hankin development. It has a very large uh, paved trail, actually, that's on one of the parcels that was uh, dedicated to the township. That's a little unusual. Uh, and some of the smaller developments, there are trails which link other trails on adjacent parcels, and the key there is the is the township gets an agreement up front, or it gets a trail easement up front, so that um, uh, public access is assured. Thank you, <clears throat> Mark Janicek. So uh, I think we're what we're hearing is that uh, the township. National Land Trust, a respected developer, 
a township official are all proponents of responsible open space development, density development, and I'm certainly a proponent of that as well. From your perspectives, and we have four different perspectives, I would believe, how do you deal with some of the challenges and how do you guide and deflect, if you will, or ease some of the concerns of, let's say, environmentalists in our township, we have um, moratoriums on sewer taps. Um, and then we have issues that I heard mentioned, things like um, increased traffic flow and et cetera. Um, how do you deal with that? We have four different perspectives, and I think that's something that we would hear in our township that could prevent responsible development from moving forward, which I believe is important. But I think those are two issue, issues that developers like CHIP and others may be challenged with. Um, so I'm curious, can, from your perspectives, help ease those concerns? I think there's always a way to resolve that, but certainly that's something that prevents not only ordinance, but realities that prevent uh, development. I think, uh, Mark, uh, as you know, that um, most of the township, well, I'm going to say 33% of the township roughly 3,000 acres is zoned R1 acre, just flat, plain Jane R1 acre. So there, there are density concerns, but, but by and large, you know, as we all know, or those familiar with this area, that, that when I went into the history of this, that, that it was designed as a residential community, sort of a bedroom community, North Wayne, South Wayne aside, that, that primarily had the flavor of, of suburban sprawl, okay, large, single-family dwellings, and then you had the subcategories, R2, R3, R4, R5, et cetera. Um, so that's the majority of the township there, and then we have a wide flavor from there. Um, but as you know, um, the, 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 what, what I'm seeing nowadays are questions and concerns about what's going to happen with our dross and, 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 and what's going to, and quite frankly, I'm not sure, but um, you know, that, those are some of the, the questions I'm receiving and how, how will that affect traffic uh, going forward? How will that be carved up if it is ever? I, I'm not sure, but, but you know, as, as I alluded to earlier, that we're pretty much built out. So the challenges I see every day and, and the questions I feel are, are, are again, what Ann talked about, are, are, are teardowns, um, uh, infill development, um, so th those are some of the things. I, I hope I addressed your, your question there. But you know, it, it's it's again, it's 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 so hard in Pennsylvania to alter or change zoning without a long, drawn-out public process. That 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 there hasn't been a lot of zoning changes, quite frankly, aside from the Wayne Business Overlay District and Garrett Hill, to uh, to accommodate things. And a lot of a lot of this occurred again in the '60s and '70s to address that population growth. And then since then, it's been sort of more. Um, piecemeal reactionary zoning. Yes, um, conservation design is is really acknowledging that land is zoned for development. Now, if a community doesn't want to see growth, um, you can certainly go to a referendum and purchase land. Um, West Vincent is an example of a community that's had a couple of open space referenda and purchased quite a bit of open space, very much supported by the public. Um, but short of purchasing land, most likely at fair market value, um, land in Pennsylvania is zoned for development. There has been a lot of litigation between here and the center of Philadelphia, and those court decisions are nearly always in favor of a developer building something, maybe not quite the way he wants, but I'm not aware of many cases that have um, prohibited ground in this region from being developed at all, unless it's extremely environmentally constrained. So I think we're looking at improving the pattern, the footprint of development. So those are two different issues, really, or they're related, but they're not the same issue. Um, if you don't want any more traffic, any more growth in your township, then you're looking at not seeing any additional increase in population, whether that's a good thing or not, 
that's what you're going to have to decide. And, and I think the answer really for that has to come from Harrisburg because uh, there was an effort years ago to change the municipality's planning code uh, and it failed miserably. About the only thing that came out of it was that local municipalities could do regional type planning and, and West Vincent is in fact uh, involved in a regional planning group. Uh, the nice thing about that is the law in Pennsylvania says right now that every municipality has to have every use in it. So you have to have heavy industry, you have to have light industry, you have to have commercial, you've got to have residential in every municipality. As long as you do re regional zoning, as long as somebody in the region has it, not every municipality has to have it. So that was one thing that came out of it. But, you know, in, in terms of infrastructure, the rule is you're entitled to develop your property even if it's going to generate lots of additional traffic. The rules are that you basically can't stop development based on traffic. Now, a, a moratorium on sewer hookups is different. I mean, that is very different. And, and what that usually does is that delays development, but it doesn't prevent it. And I would agree with Ann. If you really want to prevent development or prevent additional development, you pretty much have to go. This is not a tool for doing that. About the best thing you can do with this tool is you play with the density that's allowed. But again, that is a problem because if you attempt to zone an area um, where the density is too low, the, those are the situations where the developers come in and challenge you. And it's no secret that the reason we adopted uh, as our lowest main tier, uh, one and a half acre zoning, is that's where the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania was when that was adopted, is that generally, as long as you had one unit for an acre and a half, you were going to be okay. But, you know, the law in Pennsylvania is you are absolutely entitled to develop your property. And the great thing about this type of approach to development is it is very respectful of the environmental constraints of the property and the environmental constraints around the property. I mean, that's part of the things that you look at in the four or five step design process is you look at those and you attempt to design around those. But it's, we're in Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania rules are that you're allowed to develop your property. I'll just chime in real quick and say that I'm, I'm not um, sure, Mark, I understood which way you were going with your question, but um, you know, things like this forum are probably, to me, it, 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 it are good because um, I think people say traffic, just take traffic, for instance. I, I would guess, and I don't know, maybe the township knows, but most of the traffic in this township are people who don't live here. They travel through it. Um, the, the, a, a community of, of 35 or 40 homes just doesn't generate that much traffic um, to the point where it, it, that's any kind of a reason not to do something. Um, so I think that, you know, this whole idea of, of let's keep our township exactly the way it is when demographics are changing and all those kinds of things is a little short-sighted. And, um, and again, you know, if you look at Tremor where they, had, they just happened to have 26 acres smack dab in the middle of the borough, um, they would, I think every single person who lives there would say to you today that it has had little impact at all on, in, on their way of life or anything else. In fact, as I said, I, I would be willing to bet because of the trail increase in trails and open space that they would all now say it was a, a, a great thing that happened to them. So um, it's as much for the people of the township to understand um, rather than just saying, oh, traffic is bad or this is bad, to really understand kind of what the, the, um, the result of doing something right is. Um, just, just to take a piece of ground and say, well, this should be open space, when in fact maybe part of it being open space and part of it being a um, smaller um, lot, multifamily kind of thing would really satisfy a lot of the needs of, the, of, the, of all of us getting older people like myself. Um, and yet also um, have open space that could, could be, uh, as Jim says, maintained by homeowners associations. By the way, um, the roads in Tremor and all of the open space 
that still exists as part of Tremor is all managed by the Homeowners Association. So it was, the rest of it is all wildlife preserved with trees. There's, other than, you know, cutting a, a tree up when it falls on the trail, that's about the only maintenance the township really is involved in. So my thing is, is that, you know, people really need to just don't say no right away, but try to understand kind of what the, the, um, the result's going to be if it's done correctly. How that, how that happens is, you know, the devil's in the details, as people say, so. Um, but uh, anyway, that's my sermon for that. <laughs> Uh, Kevin Blackney. Um, Matt, I think part of this question, I have a two-part question. The beginning, I think, is for you, Matt. Uh, and if I'm, I think I heard you say that you th pretty much were built out and a lot of the um, strategies that have been talked about tonight may not be applicable other than the current de density zoning we have. Um, and if that's a wrong statement, what, how can it be applied to, to, to Radnor in any, in any way? And then the second part of my question may go to you and others. Uh, a lot has been talked about about residential properties and new residential properties. I wonder if any of these strategies have been applied to institutional properties because Radnor has a lot of institutional properties and many of those are looking to expand and so on and so forth. So a two-part question, but if you could help me out, that'd be great. Yeah, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we are built on it. I've said it over. I'll say it again. But I, I think... Um, you know, when, when I see the zoning map, I see, you know, a lot of built out areas, a lot of green on a color map of, of the R1 district, but I also see opportunities perhaps because there are some larger parcels left. Um, for example, um, Atterbury is coming in next month for a four lot subdivision. Um, it's right over here on Newtown Road uh, and Sprawl. I think that's about uh, 20 plus 20, 11, I'm sorry, 11 acres. Looked at it briefly the other day. Uh, that zoned R1, um, you know, could that be a density modification now because it needs to be, I think, minimum 15 acres plus. I'm not sure if that's the right location. Um, for, but for every large tract of land like that, we, we see a lot of smaller, also even non-conforming lots of, of land um, that were rezoned over time without much consideration for the underlying uh, parcel land itself. It was sort of this blanket zoning. Um, there are opportunities as you get to the commercial core to increase density there, and as you segue out sort of a transect, um, then uh, have it less dense with open space. But, uh, you know, there, again, the, the, the approval process, as you know, takes a long time, but uh, um, there, there are opportunities there that I see um, uh, for some potential rezoning um, if, if that's, that's the consideration. Um, but you make a good point about institutions, though. Um, <clears throat> some of them want to expand, but also some of them may disappear. Who knows? Um, but with that, I think most of them are zoned plan institution. Um, so what do you do with that land there? Does another institution immediately fill that void in, or is there opportunity to get that rezoned for maybe residential and open space, a combination of uh, it takes good vision for that, uh, a lot of thinking, a lot of neighborhood, obviously conversations. They're the, they're the ones that are gonna be impacted by this. Um, <clears throat> so not all of them, I, I envision some of them are gonna expand, but some of them actually might perhaps downsize, but you know, you never know. Uh, we have not, we don't have any institutions in the township. We barely have commercial. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but in terms of in terms of planning for the commercial, I, th I think it's been addressed in our uh, planning, and I think it could work uh, in terms of com in terms of institutional. I could it be made to work? Somebody'd have to spend a lot of time on that. I mean, I think it, it could, but um, that's that I think is a fairly unique challenge. Other questions? Keep Leslie on her toes. Thanks. Uh, 
Hi, uh, I'm uh, Jim Riley. And somebody mentioned about the uh, traffic study or impact. Uh, have you guys worked on, or women worked on the uh, issue with stormwater from developments, especially at a place that's you know, never been developed and maybe some spots that are, have been redeveloped? It seems like around here, every time a development moves in, there's a new creek that forms every time it rains. And you see water going across a road that never happened before. So I'd just like to know your experience with that. Um, well, we're seeing um, a lot of communities require infiltration of stormwater. Um, I think the Chester County Planning Commission has an excellent model stormwater ordinance. I'm not familiar with Radnor's stormwater code, so perhaps yours is, is equally up to date. I have found that conservation subdivisions give you places to infiltrate stormwater. Um, in that four-step design process I talked about, during that first step of identifying the open space, um, the ordinance also requires that you identify the best places on the property for stormwater infiltration. If you can leave those infiltrating soils for stormwater areas and not pave them over for houses, you're going to do a better job of managing that runoff. Um, and I know West Vincent's applied that in new subdivisions for probably since the code was first adopted. It has, and I'll, I'll echo what she says, but I'll also say again, part of the issue is the state of Pennsylvania. In, in terms of the, the what a developer has to design to, and the rule is you know, they design to an X year storm, and that's the storm water they've got to deal with. Well, since I've lived in West Vincent, we've had 300 year storms, a 500 year storm, and a 5,000 year storm. So, um, you know, if you're infiltrating or, or dealing with the two year storm, well, we have a two year storm about every other week. It's a real problem. Uh, but part of, the, part of the state rules are that, you know, the, uh, there's a limit as to where you can go. Now, municipalities have gotten more stringent, and, and you know, our township requires infiltration. There's, you know, uh, roof drains have to go underground. There's a lot of things that, that have to be done. Uh, uh, the county and, and the state have gotten, you know, you have the best management practices. You have their BMPs. There's a manual which now has BMPs that apply in Pennsylvania. Uh, stormwater is a developing issue. But one of the problems is, what are you going to require people to design to? And be careful what you ask them to design to, because if you ask them to, to keep the 100-year storm on their property, well, that could be a hole as big as this room, which is incredibly ugly. It works, but it's a problem. So uh, stormwater is something that, that takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of thought and it, it's something that in my job, and, and you know, I work a lot with engineers uh, who represent the township and who look at this, um, we try very hard to, to get something that's going to work. But on the other hand, we also try and get something that isn't going to be horrific. Uh, and we just had a situation where the developer came in and said, if you don't give me this, I'm going to, you know, treat stormwater the way certain people want me to do on this property, and that's to put in a retention basin, which is you know, the size of a small lake. Um, and nobody wanted that. So you've got to look at new technologies. You've got to look at new things. And, uh, and you've got to have some teeth to your ordinances, which, which require a certain level, but also require a certain level of thought and engineering behind them because the, the simplest and easiest thing to do is just to put a, a basin out there. And, you know, those work, but they create problems. I'll just say a couple things. One is that um, if you take Brook Farm, um, I may be off a little bit, but there's probably close to 2,000 feet 
uh, six foot diameter pipe buried in Brook Farm that basically all of the stormwater has to go through and it, so that it would have to fill up all that pipe and they all have perforations in it so all of as Ian was saying it, there's a huge amount of recharge at, at Brook Farm I'd be um, and I'm glad Jim brought up the fact that the storms that we've been getting the last three or four years have just I mean I've been doing this a long time and I have to say I've, you know other than the hurricane that came through eight or nine years or whatever it was ago Agnes I guess I've never seen rain like we've had but at Traymore, the other interesting thing about Traymore and the fact that there's higher density, if you take, there's only 18 buildings there that are, if you take the roof um, space, um, it's not a whole lot different than what a single family house of a larger size, I mean, of, of would have been. The driveways are literally maybe 23 feet um, long and the streets are only 18 feet wide. So. I would be willing to bet that the amount of impervious cover um, that we've created relative to what we could have if we put 21 houses, 21 large houses there is probably something maybe, I don't, I just, I don't know, but I know it's less. So um, stormwater is an issue. There's no doubt about it. We, at, at, at Tremor, most everything is infiltrated. There's only a small amount that actually um, is not. But infiltration only works for so long. A hundred-year storm, it it overflows the um, the infiltration system, and then it has to go someplace um, else. But um, I think Jim said, it, I, I, as long as you're going to allow your township to grow some, there's going to be uh, stormwater that has to be dealt with, and um, it's more than what would have been here if it hadn't grown at all. But um, there's a I can't tell you the amount of work we have to do um, stormwater-wise to prove that what we're doing isn't going to create some sort of problem, so. Okay, we probably have time for maybe two, two or three more questions. Tom Lowey, uh, my question has to do with a comparison between Traymore development and the possible development taking or could be taking place at the what used to be Poplar House, uh, see similar size lot, I think uh, 35 acres, 26 acres. Could you address that, Matt? And yeah, from my understanding, what the house obviously was demolished, but uh, there hasn't been any land development plans submitted. Uh, of my understanding, with conversations with Mr. Holloway. Um, I haven't spoken to the property owner that it's just going to be one house there. And I know of no other house that to, to be built on that lot. I think initially it was plans to carve up a section of it, but nothing else has, uh, has been submitted. And that's about it is. It's about uh, 30 acres. I, I didn't hear what you know, said. It, it's, it, and Bill Springer, commissioner, third ward commissioner, over there said it is going to be. How, any idea how many? No, I, I I heard just uh, four or five houses on Brook Road. Oh. That's all. But I'll see the plan at the, when they're unveiled at this party. I'll let you know. Okay, great. That is zoned. Uh, that is zoned uh, agricultural uh, conservation. Dist uh, de the the density modification there as well. It's interesting you bring that property up. I actually, um, as any good developer would, um, I looked at that property um, uh, before it was bought by the people that now bought it with the idea of doing a trade war on part of it and deed restricting the other part. You wouldn't have any more. Um, in that case, there wouldn't have been a higher density, um, uh, but you would have conserved the, assuming that the Poplar House was worth conserving in the sense that, you know, somebody still has to pay to live there and pay the taxes and upkeep and all the rest of it. Forgetting that for the moment, but we looked at, at possibly carving the piece in half and, excuse me, de-restricting the, the, the part that would keep the house and then building a Tremor-type community on the side that actually um, faced Brook Road. 
Um, and um, we just never got very far because it sold before that. But I can tell you just from the people that I talk to and the people that, um, that come to our communities and things, a Traymore job there would sell out in about 10 minutes because there's such a demand for that kind of housing um, in, in the township for people who live in the township. I mean, that's part of the key. There's a lot of people who live here want to stay here, but their alternatives are not. I mean, look at Inverary, which, um, again, I was involved in a little bit. Um, it was way ahead of its time, but it still is a very desirable place to live. And um, um, there's a reason for that. It it kind of fits the – it doesn't have quite the maintenance um, – uh, you can get away from a lot of the maintenance there, but still, it's it's what a lot of people want today. And I think the people who live here um, currently and the people um, who are making decisions need to understand that that type of housing still there's going to be a big demand for. And somehow, if it's at all possible, to think about how that can be met. Um, just don't push it off into some other township or because then those people will be driving through your township. Um, instead of <laughs> instead of starting out here, anyway. And, and it's not responsive to the question, but the biggest competition in the regional group that West Vincent is part of is competition for restricted age housing, because everybody wants it because um, there's no children, it's no burden on the school system, and assuming you get transfer taxes and they pay taxes, which is an assumption. Um, they are considered by many municipalities to not only be a cash cow, but also where its residents will go to as they age. So, yeah, there is a tremendous demand in many townships for restricted age housing. And one of the real fights in, in, in amongst the region that we're a member of is for that type of housing. John Fisher, a question, I guess, primarily for Ann. Uh, Matt mentioned uh, the Atterbury property. Are there any green techniques, green zoning techniques that you've worked on or are aware of that would work for parcels as small as, say, 10 acres or even 5 acres? Because we have a lot more of those size parcels in Radnor that we have the kind of the open space that they have in West Vincent. Um, well, um, Lower Marion's ordinance has set the threshold at 5 acres since... December 1990, um, when the open space is small, you know, in that two to maybe five acre range, um, you might consider a deed restriction rather than a more formal conservation easement. It might be harder to find a conservancy or group to hold the easement. Um, we also look at sort of the number of houses. It, seems to make sense to form a homeowners association when you reach around five homes. Although in these more developed suburbs, you do sometimes see, I mean, I can think of two subdivisions up the road that have homeowners associations for three homes. But in general, you look at about five homes as the threshold for a homeowners association. So, um, I mean, I think the technique works on smaller properties, but it can be more challenging, I admit that. Chance for the final question. All right, I'll ask the final question. Um, I, just one last kind of wrap up question. I'm, I'm wondering if you know, those of you who've been through the process of, of getting the zoning ordinance adopted for this, were there any Lessons learned, any, any, anything that was surprising that, that came out of that process that you would like to share with us to help us along the learning curve? You're talking about the ordinance that we... Yeah, did actually getting the ordinance adopted. Was there anything... Well, just like, we, just like we spent a good deal of time um, figuring out where the trees were and the houses were and then figured out where we could put houses and then we figured out where the road could go kind of did the same thing with the ordinance in that once we did all that, then we decided how we were going to draw up the ordinance to make all that work. And the key was, though, that the ordinance had to work anywhere in the township. Now, 
the key to that is the fact that it, you have to have a piece of ground of 25 acres or more, so that pretty much eliminated everything else. But, but it, that's kind of how that ordinance was done. And, um, and Natural Lands Trust, um, uh, the gal that was, was there on a regular basis, kind of kept you know, everybody kind of going in the right direction in terms of the amount of open space and um, everything from architecture to garage facing and all those kinds of things. I mean, there was there was a number of, because it, it's actually a zoning ordinance and a land development ordinance, right? PR, it's, a, it's an overlay. It's actually what it is, is an overlay. So, which is not a bad way to go, by the way, at least from my, I'm not a student of it like Ann is, but Overlay is kind of a, a nice thing because it doesn't have to be zoned. You have to go through a uh, a process to get your ordinance overlay onto a piece of ground that isn't currently zoned that way. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons, you know, that could be could keep it from happening. But um, certainly the overlay, as opposed to just rezoning pieces, but say, okay, you can use this overlay. Um, you, you know, the Atterbury property. I hate to say this, but I'm actually subdividing that not for myself but I was asked by the estate to help them and I said to them man this would be a perfect place for about 15 townhouses but it, it the process would have taken much more time than the the estate has in terms of um, getting out of it what they felt was necessary to you know get the money to all the heirs so it just I said, you, you just don't have the time here. But that's a great example, in my opinion, of a piece of ground that is in a location in the township that has the road network. Um, you're close to the Blue Route. You know, you're you know not you can't really walk to downtown Wayne or what. But it it would be a perfect spot. Um, but it under your current zoning there's nothing that would really and to do density modification you're still going to end up with larger houses in fact the subdivision we're doing is actually three new houses and keeping the old one they're going to have to be fairly large because the lots are fairly large and if they want to get any kind of money for the property at all um, they're going to have to sell the ground for a fairly large amount of money they're actually trying to sell it as is and they're hoping somebody will come along they really don't want to subdivide it but there's not a lot of demand for large houses on 11 acres today, so anyway. And, and just to chime in, when I came on the Planning Commission, I think I came on in 1997, it was seven years into the process of adopting the, the Growing Greener Ordinance. So it took us eight years to adopt the ordinance. Um, the only guidance I have for you is, and, and the, the real problem was, I came onto a planning commission where they were mired in endless discussions on what was the right density. And, and basically, I put together a, a group, of, a, a majority of people on the planning commission, and the decision was, look, we just have to make a decision and move forward, because if we don't, we're going to be in this process for another eight years. But you have to view these ordinances as living and breathing ordinances. You have to be willing to, when something comes up, to amend them and to amend them quickly. Uh, the consolidation we just did in 2010 uh, was of the 2003 ordinance. And the 2003 ordinance we amended three times in 2004, about as many in 2005. Uh, and, we, and you know, when something comes up, you amend it to address an issue that comes up. And you can't be afraid to amend it. The only thing I can say is, you know, yes, this is a big deal. It would be a huge change. There's advantages to it. But at some point in time, after you've, you've worked with your consultants, and now at least there's a number of these ordinances out there that you can look at, and, and people have gone through the process, uh, which there really wasn't when, when we were going through the process. Uh, but at some point in time, you just have to do it and, and be committed to when issues come up that you're going to address them and address them quickly. Real quick, I, th I think the other thing I would say is what I said earlier, which is they didn't know. <laughs> they had no, um, nobody was complaining. Nobody was fighting anything. Everybody had an open mind because they'd never had even a subdivision done 
in the 50 or 60 years you know, before. And so when you start with a clean slate and not any preconceived ideas, it actually is a little bit easier, a lot easier actually, to get something like that done. We really, we did an entire ordinance in about a year, I would say, which, and, but we met a lot, and the people in the borough were willing to meet a lot to do it because they just wanted something really great to happen. I think, I mean, Rose Valley to me is a wonderful story because the borough and a developer um, were able to work cooperatively together. Um, at any point, the township could have said, no, the developer could have filed curative amendments. There's no end to the creative um, you know, litigation that his land use attorneys could have come up with, I'm sure. But I mean, Radnor is not Rose Valley Borough. Um, Rose Valley Borough had not seen a subdivision since 1968. Um, you've seen plenty of development. You're a sophisticated community with good codes. Um, you know, you don't need to, you're not going to see a, a 20 year gap and then your last property developed. So, I mean, Rose Valley's an incredible story and a great credit to both the developer and borough council. But I don't think that's a process here that you need to replicate. You have zoning codes, you update them often, and I think Jim's experience of um, hopefully not eight years, but, but working through it and acknowledging that your codes in all districts, not just residential, are living and breathing. And because you're constantly changing, you have to change with those times. Um, so Chip has a great story, but I don't know that that's the path you're going to follow, except maybe that one year time frame that he liked. <laughs> it, it is a bit of a fairy tale, I would agree, but um, it can happen. So. <laughs> But, but I also think, lastly, that um, part of to help the process along of getting things adopted is to have a good comprehensive plan in place. I'll give you an example here. Um, here's the one from 1964. This was 34 pages long. Um, 1988 moved up to 154 pages. And by the time 2003 was over to 500 pages. So we're, our, our, our criteria is expanding. Our ideas are expanding. I think in, uh, our next one is due in about, uh, according to the Municipal planning's co Planning Code, uh, in 2013. So I might need a two-wheeler to bring that thing in. But it's, the, the point is, is that, that it, this is where the ideas are and to get them in here. And it makes it a lot easier to follow. Not that new things won't come along, but it's important to have a good vision and your comprehensive plan. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panelists and, and to everybody who came out tonight. Let me just, in, in closing, say if, if anybody has comments or thoughts about conservation development and you want to share them, we encourage you to, to contact your commissioners or township officials. And um, for any, I, I know a lot of commissioners were in the audience tonight, which is terrific. Um, but if any of your commissioners have not seen the program, to remind them that it is, it has been taped and it will be running on the local channel. So again, thank you for coming out tonight and be safe.